Hi, it's really great to see you. Thanks for coming. Now that we've all befriended the bee, <laughs> I want to talk about something completely different. I discovered the power of these two words 40 years ago in a small rural village that was facing some really tough decisions. I want to talk about that story and tell it to you, and then I want to follow up by uh, talking about how we can apply what if to some of the more intractable environmental programs or problems that we face today. The village was Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin, a town of about 500 people, very small, located on the banks of the Kickapoo River. This is a map of Wisconsin, as you can tell. It shows where the Kickapoo River Valley is. Soldiers Grove was located in what was called the Cooley region of Wisconsin, where the glaciers had pushed the terrain into 300-foot hills beautiful section of the country, and you can see a little bit of the Kickapoo River there on the left. Soldiers Grove was founded on the banks of this river. The first business there was a lumber mill, and the lumber people from upriver would float their logs down to be processed in this mill. And then the town grew up around that mill, and the river was fairly calm. It was a good neighbor, uh, but something important is in this picture. It is the hill behind the village. In fact, Soldiers Grove was surrounded by these hills, and they created a kind of bowl. And when it rained, and when the Kickapoo overflowed, it filled up the bottom of the bowl. Over the years, there were a lot of little floods. They called them ankle ticklers. But there were also these. About once every 10 years in the last century, the Kickapoo really reared up and flooded Soldiers Grove. And what did the people do? Every time they had a flood like this, they washed out the muck, replaced their belongings, and moved back in. It was as if they were saying, thank you, Mother Nature, may I have another? They thought of themselves as river rats, they called themselves. Their fathers and mothers and grandfathers had lived in this town. The town existed for more than 100 years on the Kickapoo, and they were quite proud of themselves for not letting the river beat them. It wasn't just the Kickapoo's fault, though, that they were getting these floods. In fact, quite a bit of it had to do with their behavior. They decided to live in the path of a river. Rivers flood. They flow when they flood. And a lot of people in this country have decided to live right on the side of them in disaster zones. But also, upriver, as the lumbering people denuded the hillsides, and then farming came along and further denuded the hillsides, water began to flow down. It no longer caught the raindrops where they fell. And that caused erosion that filled in the riverbed and made it less able to hold water. So the floods got worse. And then in the lower right here, you can see a wetland. Many, many communities in our, and, and farmers for that matter, in our country have destroyed wetlands. They're tremendous natural sponges. And they give water a place to go, besides in villages like Soldiers Grove. I got to the village in 1975. I bought the newspaper. It was always a dream of a print journalist, which was my background, to become a country editor at some point. So I bought the paper to fulfill that dream. It was on my bucket list. And the very first assignment I had was to cover a meeting of the whole town in the junior high school gym where the Army Corps of Engineers was explaining how they were going to solve the flood problem in Soldiers Grove. They'd been studying it for 30 years. They proposed building a $3.5 million levy around the town to protect only a million dollars worth of property. That didn't seem to make a lot of sense to us, and the more they explained this proposal, the sillier it sounded. And I'm going to get a drink of water because I talked myself dry. Excuse me. So as we were leaving the junior high school gym that evening after the meeting, I was walking aside one of the local businessmen, and he said to me, you know, we ought to just pick this town up and move it out of here, and we laughed. At about 3.15 that morning, you know, the following morning, I was in bed, and I woke up all of a sudden, and I thought, what if we did? What if we did move this town out of the floodplain and to higher ground? And I raced down to the newspaper office, and I typed up a proposal to the Corps of Engineers called Relocation, an alternative for the village of Soldiers Grove. And the idea was to move the town from point A, where it was flooding, to point B, half a mile away on higher ground, where it would not flood again. And this was a radical idea. The menu of choices that the people of Soldiers Grove knew were very few. They were to move back into the floodplain. This opened up a whole new menu of choices. What if, when people come in conflict with nature, people make the change? 
what if they let the river be the river and they could be a village and they would be good neighbors, but they would move out of the path of the river? What if? <laughs> this was the Corps of Engineers' response. Uh, this means no, by the way. I, this, uh, they said no. Okay. But over the course of the next eight years, Soldiers Grove did a really amazing thing. It moved anyway. It found a way to do it. It wasn't easy, and I'm not going to go into great detail. I've written a lot of books about it, but you can imagine getting 500 people to agree to anything. And this was a big change. These people had never done anything like this before. They were farmers and retired shopkeepers. As I said, they've always known the river. And this was a big, courageous thing they did that I deserve absolutely no credit for. Because all I and my colleagues did was expand their menu. We asked, what if? And then they did too. They decided to create not just a new town, but the first solar community in the United States. This happened at the end of the 1970s when there had been the Arab oil embargoes and everybody was thinking about energy independence. And they said, why not? So they built buildings that received at least half and often three quarters of their heating energy from passive solar systems, which was a big deal in a cold state like Wisconsin. I just for a second want to show you my favorite building. Um, oxymoronic building, a uh, gas station heated by sunlight. <laughs> and um, I love this. It seemed like a victory of some kind. And I want you to notice the price of gas because you'll never see that again. <laughs> so what if we applied some of these same choices that Soldiers Grove finally applied to some of the other problems we have with the environment? The first thing to think about is that today's environmental problems are not the problems of our fathers and mothers. They used to be local. They used to be fixable with local action. This is the burning of the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland in 1969. It had burned 13 times prior to this, but the nation noticed this one because Time Magazine covered it. And it seemed so anti-intuitive that water would catch fire that it startled people uh, awake about how extreme some of our environmental problems were. And this it was one of the seminal events that opened up the modern environmental era. And Congress soon after passed the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and a lot of other uh, environmental laws that still exist today. The problem is different today. Everybody's pollution is everybody's problem. Environmental problems, many of them have gone global. This is a picture from space showing pollution from industries in China migrating across the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of the United States. We know from Ebola. We know from the world economic recession. We know from invasive species traveling on airplanes. We are a connected world. And so we now have a larger responsibility than we used to, and these are no longer, many of them, uh, local problems. And one of the biggest of the environmental problems, the one I consider the mother of environmental problems, is climate change. This is the Earth's atmosphere. atmosphere. The red band is called the troposphere. And what happens when we burn greenhouse gases is that the pollution from those gases get trapped in that red band. <laughs> and they act like a blanket that holds heat on the Earth's surface and in the oceans, and that causes global warming. And the consequences of that are things like drought and fire and flood that we here know a lot about. Nationally, the cost of these disasters, the billion dollar disasters, the really big ones, have been going up steadily for many years now, and they continue to grow. And as Congressman Polis knows now, our National Flood Insurance Program is already $28 billion in debt because of the size of the disasters we've been experiencing lately. We have in the past dealt with flooding this way, and I'm going to talk about flooding because it's the most common of these environmental consequences, these severe weather events. In 1917, the Congress passed a bill called the National Flood Control Act to try to solve the increasing problems of flooding around the country. And between 1917 and 1970, Congress passed 20 different amendments to that bill because they couldn't get it right. The damages kept going up. Today, as a result, we have 84,000 dams that cost about $135 billion to build. They are in bad shape. They're getting old, even older than me. And uh, the estimate is it'll cost $20 billion to repair them. We have 100,000 miles of levees. And that is enough to go coast to coast 33 times, and a large percentage of the U.S. population is ostensibly protected by levees, and they're getting old too. 
Sometimes they fail. And make no mistake, dams have saved a lot of lives and a lot of property. But many things can make them fail, and sometimes they do. And because people felt confident and developed below them, sometimes the damages and the deaths are even larger than they would have been. So this shows you uh, that we're having about $9 billion on average of damages from floods every year, and we lose 90 people a year to this disaster. So what if? What if we decided to collaborate with nature rather than trying to control it? What if we decided to fix the mistakes we've made, the parts of nature that used to help us do these things for free, but that we broke? And this shows a wetlands restoration project going on in the country on the left, and on the right, the restoration of some marshlands on the coast to protect coastal areas from storm surges. This kind of thing is happening around the country. It needs to happen a great deal more, but it's underway. Some communities are even putting the meander back in rivers. The meander is another device that nature uses to slow down the flow of water. And you can see in the middle picture there, in 1965, the Corps decided that the way to control floods was to channelize the river, which of course was exactly the wrong thing to do. So here in Kissimmee, they're restoring that crooked river pattern. It's happening elsewhere too, Dallas, Texas, Naperville, Illinois, the Napa River Valley in California, People are putting nature back to work. And the neat thing about this, by the way, is you don't have to maintain it. You don't build up maintenance costs like we have with dams and levees. If you leave nature alone, it's self-sustaining and self-nourishing. It'll take care of the problem. What if we had a national program to catch rain drops where they fall? Instead of allowing them to turn into stormwater, which is very expensive to control, and ends up flooding people. This is the City Hall in Chicago, which put a green roof on its top, and Chicago has a plan to put these kinds of gardens on every flat roof surface it can in that city. And other communities are doing it too. This one I love, this is Finley Stadium in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where they've created the driveway out of a permeable form of concrete so that when rain falls, it seeps through into an underground reservoir, and they use that water to water the field. It's a genius. What if we applied some of these ideas also to another big problem, and that's our energy system, which received a D-plus from the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers last year. Our energy system, our miles and miles of pipelines and transmission lines, have been called the greatest engineering achievement of the last century. And they really are pretty miraculous, but they're also very fragile, subject to storms and bad weather, subject to cyber attack, subject to other kinds of interruptions, even a tree branch touching a power line can shut out the power for millions of people for quite a long time. Our 400,000 miles of transmission lines are enough to go around the earth 16 times. Our 1.6 million or billion miles of pipelines are enough to go around the earth 66 times. And these systems are aging too, as are our coal-fired power plants. So when we get energy, we do it this way right now. Coal is the most common way we get electricity in this country, and here in Appalachia is mountaintop removal coal mining, where they're blowing up the tops of mountains and turning that beautiful, biodiverse, hilly, culturally rich region into a moonscape. And once we get the coal, we stick it in a coal-fired power plant, and the pollution ends up, as I said before, in the troposphere. We're hurting ourselves here. So what if we didn't? What if we decided to go another direction and simply harvest the energy that's all around us almost all the time for free and clean? What if we did it differently and began to collaborate with nature? And this is an artist's conception of what wind power might look like. I doubt it would look like that, but you get the idea. This is what wind power really looks like, and this is a 21st century power plant. This is a 21st century power plant. This is a 21st century power plant. And if Oprah were giving this talk, she would say, you can be a power plant, and you can be a power plant, and you could be a power plant. <laughs> and the fact is, you can. <laughs> I'm happy that we're seeing solar and wind power growing very rapidly in this country right now. It's still a teeny percentage of our energy but it's headed in the right direction, and we need to do a lot more. I wanted to point out before I move on that uh, energy infrastructure and dams aren't the only things we're having maintenance problems with right now. Overall, our infrastructure in the United States is aging and was given a D-plus by the American Society of Civil Engineers last year, and they estimated it'll cost $3.6 trillion 
to bring these, energy, these systems back to where they need to be. That is a $1,000 bill laid on top of other $1,000 bills for 227 miles high. That's a lot of money. So why not look for nature to do some of these things for free? They're called ecosystem services. What if we took advantage of them? Now, Amy mentioned Rachel Carson and her seminal role also in starting the modern environmental movement. And she said, man is a part of nature and his war of na with nature is inevitably a war against himself. We are learning this the hard way. What if, we, instead of taking resources, we received the ones that are given to us by nature? What if, instead of dominating nature, we understood how interdependent we are, interconnected with it we are? And what if, rather than controlling nature, we decided we wanted to collaborate with it and earn back some of those eco ecosystem services? Now, many of our problems <laughs> are really tough ones in this country, and we have to make a lot of decisions about how to solve them. And sometimes they're so formidable we despair that we can't, as individuals or as communities, do much about it. But I'm reminded of Buckminster Fuller, who said, we are called to be architects of our future, not its victims. And I'm reminded of 1975, when we all, who were alive at that time, had this first picture of the full Earth from space. It was called the Little Blue Marble. And it shocked us into the awareness for the first time that we live on this finite little neighborhood hurtling through infinite space, and it's the only one we got. So what if? What if often leads to why not, as it did in Soldier's Grove? So when I despair, I think back to that village. It really changed my way of thinking about things forevermore. It was an amazing feat for this little village to accomplish. And when they dedicated the village in 1983, they put up this plaque. And so you don't have to speed read it, I'm gonna read it to you. Respectfully dedicated to all the minds who have the courage to dream, to all the hands who help make the dream a reality, and to all the souls, some yet to come, who will nourish this idea, that people working together can make a better life. What if? Thank you. <laughs>